Well, we're going to be looking at Psalm 14 and Psalm 18. I originally intended to take us into Psalm 19. Couldn't do it. And so we're going to look at Psalm 14 and Psalm 18. And uh, obviously, last time we were together looking at the Psalms, I made the mistake. I had thought that we had already looked at Psalm 14, and of course we hadn't, so I had begun you in Psalm 15, and I continued up to Psalm 17, so I have to go back to Psalm 14 now and uh, then pick up at Psalm 18. And so let's read uh, Psalm 14 together, and we'll get into our study this, this evening. Psalm 14, beginning at verse 1. Uh, the psalmist David writes, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There's none who does good. No, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on the Lord? There they are in great fear. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You shame the counsel of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord brings back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Now, Psalm 14 is a psalm that has been included in a category of psalms that is called wisdom psalms. And in Psalm 14, we see David contrasting a fool with one who is wise. And the one who is wise is the one who worships the Lord. And that's what you're going to see as we go through this psalm. Notice how David says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, the word fool speaks of a person who is morally insensible. It's a person who uh, willfully disregards God and willfully rejects God's commandments. And when a person willfully disregards God and his word, there's only one result, and that result is being separated from the wisdom of God because the wisdom of God is declared to us and is found by us in the Bible. So when somebody says that, they, uh, that there is no God, and when that person is classified, as it says here in this scripture, as a fool, that morally insensible person wants nothing to do with the Word of God. The result, separation. Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. So a person who doesn't get into the Word of God is regarded by God himself as a fool. Now, I want you to notice something here in this psalm. It, it points out that the person who disregards God's word and who uh, rejects uh, uh, a knowledge of the one true God is a person who has a life that is regarded as corrupt. And the corruption that this person has actually flows from their innermost being. It comes from their heart. Notice he says, the fool has said, in his heart there is no God. And so from deep within, from the innermost being, comes this kind of mentality. That's why the Bible in Proverbs 4.23 says, to keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs forth the issues of life. In uh, Mark's gospel, in chapter 7, Jesus was speaking in that particular portion of Scripture. And Jesus, in chapter 7, verse 21 through 23 of the gospel of Mark, said, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, Deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. He said all these evil things come from within and defile a man. And so the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. From the innermost being of that individual, there's a rejection of the one true God. Now, I want to say something briefly to you. The fool here is not necessarily an atheist, though it may include an atheist when he says there is no God whatsoever. But this is a person who simply disregards God. Because during the time of the writing of this psalm, there were many people who were idolaters. They would believe in a God or maybe many gods. But God is saying, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, in the sense that he is saying, there is not one true and living God. So some are fools, even though they have a belief in a God or many gods. That's the point that he's making here. Now, I had an interesting interview today. I got a, a phone call from the Daily Bulletin, and uh, a young lady 
real sweet young lady, by the way, uh, called and wanted to speak to me about the passion of the Christ because there's going to be a, um, an article apparently this upcoming Sunday in the Daily Bulletin in relation to that particular movie. And so uh, she's been calling various churches, speaking to a variety of pastors and all, asking what their uh, take on that particular movie is. And we had a, a real, real nice time and a great visit for probably 15 to 20 minutes. I, I don't know if any of my comments will find their way into a newspaper, but it was a great time. We had a great, great conversation. And at the conclusion of it, um, you know, I hung up the phone and I thought, you know what? I ought to invite her to the movie. So we called her up and we said, would you like to go to the movie well, with our church? And she said, you know what, I, I'd love to. And she's going to bring her husband who doesn't know a single thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you might want to pray for her. Her name is LaRue. And you might want to pray for her. I don't know if she's a believer or not. She, in her conversation, mentioned to me that uh, a brother-in-law of hers is a Calvary Chapel minister in one of the, of the chapels in the uh, Temecula area. And so I, I don't know, I didn't really press her to ask her about her, her own commitment, though I did get the impression that she has made a commitment to the Lord. But it was a great conversation. Yet as we were speaking um, uh, and all of that, um, I'm, how many of you guys saw the Diane Sawyer interview with uh, Mel Gibson, so I know who I'm speaking to? Uh, it would have been good for you if you'd have been able to see it. It would have been good for you to see it because I thought it was very instructive. But I thought Mel Gibson handled his, the questions very well, very commendably. I was very impressed with the way that he did it. You know, obviously he's not afraid of Diane Sawyer, and so... I thought it was interesting, but I found this interesting, and there's reason for all of that conversation to get to the single point, and it's this. Diane Sawyer said something like this. She said that surveys in the United States declare that some 82% of the American population, I want you to think about this for a minute, some 82% of the American population identify themselves as Christian. Now, we've got some 300 million Americans. I want you to be thinking in large figures for just a moment. So out of that 300 million Americans, 82% identify themselves as Christian. 1% identify themselves as Jewish. Less than 1% identify themselves as Muslim. And then the rest of the percentage uh, identify themselves as no particular religion. And so that's what she was saying. Now, I want you to think about that. 82% say that they identify with the Christian faith. And then she says, with such wide diversity. And I, and I thought, you have 100 people in a room. 82 of those people say they believe in the Christian faith. One person says, I'm Jewish. Less than one person <laughs> says that they are, they're Muslim, and the rest haven't made up their mind. And she says that is, that is great diversity. And I thought that is, I don't know the proper word for that, but it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And, and what we have today is we have people who will say, I do believe that there is a God, but I'm not quite sure whether the God you worship is really the God because there are other kinds of deities or powers or whatever out there. And God says, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. It's not as if he's simply saying that the fools are restricted simply to one that we would, re we would refer to as like an, an atheist who says there is no God, absolutely. And, and you know, the, the atheist who is absolutely certain there are no such things as absolutes, you know. And so there is no God. You know, I'm absolutely certain that there is no God. And so you have people who are absolutely certain about some things. And all. yes, that would be the fool according to Scripture because they're morally insensible. But there are others that would fall in that category who, who believe in a multiplicity of gods and yet have not come to a knowledge of, of the true and the living God. And that's what he's speaking about here in Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Uh, no God worthy of my total commitment and adoration of. And, uh, and we live in a society that I think 
I can understand that very well. And uh, there's, a, there's something that happens here, though, and I want you to see this because the point that he's making is that when the fool believes like this, the result is, is an abominable life. The result is corruption. Their lives are devoid of absolute good. Notice what he says here. He says, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. They are corrupt. They have done abom abominable works. There's none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They, they've all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There's none who does good. No, not one. So notice how he emphasizes that, corruption and none seeking God and none doing good, because out of his wellspring of his personal belief system, a life is formed. And if you don't believe in a God and there's no fear of God in your heart, then the life system or life form or the way you live is going to be to God corrupt. Now, you might find this interesting. The word corrupt means decayed or rotten. The word is used to describe rancid milk. And so it, it has, well, I don't know if you've ever smelled rotten milk. It has a certain odor to it. Or rotten flesh, rotten meat. Like that time Marie and I went grocery shopping and returned and I unloaded the car and put everything away and the next day I was driving and to work and I smelled this, this terrible odor and I, I looked underneath the front seat for my gym socks. They weren't there and I was thinking, what is it? That is so bad, you know. And so I drive to work, and I had to spray Lysol inside the whole car, and I rolled the windows down, and it's during the summer. It was in a very hot summer month. And then the next day, I, I climb back in the car, and, and, and it's there again, and I do the same thing, and I'm searching everywhere under the seats and all, and I spray the Lysol, roll the windows down, and drive to work and come on back. Finally, the third day, you know, I, I said, so, I, uh, no, I, I, this, is, this is really bad. So I opened the trunk. And there in the trunk is all the meat that we had bought but had failed to put in the refrigerator. And that's the decay. That's the smell. That's what he's talking about. He said it's absolutely stinky. It is corrupt. It has an ugly odor to it. And, and the fool's life smells in the nostrils of God. That's what he's saying. And he's saying they don't seek to do good. They don't understand. They have no desire to come after him, which is an interesting thing. Because notice in verses 2 and 3 how it says that the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men. And, and what that speaks about is God looking down, examining the hearts and actions of human beings. And as he's evaluating them, he's making judgment that none are seeking after him. And that's because they do not naturally pursue him because they don't desire to do that which is pleasing to him. And so obviously the answer to such a condition is uh, that he seeks after us because we do not naturally seek after him. The Bible says, and I want you to notice that in verse 3, they have all turned aside, they have together become corrupt, there is none who does good, no, not one. Notice verse 2, the last portion where it says, he, he looks to see if there are any who understand who seek God. The answer is no. Now somebody, of course, will immediately argue and say, I was seeking the Lord, that's how I got saved. But the Bible says there's none who seek after Him. The real answer is that he sought after you. And it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve transgressed, when Adam took of that, that forbidden fruit and he did so willfully and uh, transgressed, he sinned. And, and, and the Bible says that God began to pursue after him. That's why the Scripture says the voice of the Lord was calling out to him in the garden and called him out by his name, Adam. And you see that all through the Old as well as the New Testament, where God is actually the one who pursues us. Uh, that's, uh, that's why the Lord refers to himself as a shepherd. If you take notes, in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, in chapter 34, verse 12, uh, the Bible says, As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he's among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When it says the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, he's speaking of Jesus Christ. 
and the Lord is saying, we are like sheep that have gone astray. In Matthew 18, verse 11, Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. He seeks and he saves. And so we are not seeking after him. He is actually seeking after us. Because as he looks down from heaven, there's none who understand and none who seek after him. Verse 4, have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on the Lord? Because they're ignoring uh, that God is evaluating them, evildoers try to devour God's people. They consider believers ignorant and weak, and they bully them whenever possible. That's the point he's making, and I think you're seeing that going on even right now. We see that quite often. We see that in what has been referred to as an act of civil disobedience in San Francisco. Uh, it's interesting how they're referring to it as an act of civil disobedience. As I recall, civil disobedience during the 60s, that usually was accompanied by, by people going to jail. And I haven't seen any arrests being made, and I'm finding it difficult to consider that civil disobedience. What that is, is anything but that. And so what we end up with is a, is a minister or somebody who says that gay marriages are, are one, illegal, two, they're not being recognized because that's just a, an action that's taken place by a mayor in San Francisco with no legal authority to do that whatsoever. Then what we end up with is uh, people like myself who would say, that's wrong, it's not a right thing to do. Well, they're going to be saying that we're bigoted and we're idiots and blah, 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 you know, which I find very interesting because... I hope you don't mind me saying this, even if you do. I just feel like it, and so I will. Um, but um, when people are saying that, uh, as a homosexual, they are saying, uh, we were born in this condition, and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, you know, I, I have known uh, people who are homosexual, have been oriented towards homosexuality, who have come to Christ and are no longer homosexual. And, and, uh, and that's because you can make changes of behavior. Uh, but if it were genetic, if there's something that was programming you, uh, then there'd be no ability to make any changes. It just wouldn't occur. Uh, it's like I heard an African-American woman on one occasion say, you know, I can uh, be a lesbian, she said, and I can change and become heterosexual. But no matter how I might say I'd like to change from being African-American, I will always be so because that's what I am. And there's a difference between what you are genetically and what you choose to be. And so that's, the, I think, part of the problem that we're dealing with right now is the church has been very silent on issues like this. And the Bible is very clear that if any person's in Christ, they're a new creation, old things are passed away. And God can transform you. You see, there are those who are arguing right now saying, well, well, the reason the biblical writers stated the things that they did is because they're not scientific. You see, they didn't have enough intelligence and education at that time to realize that these are things that people are actually born as. See, uh, Jesus himself wasn't wise enough to know that. And so the bottom line is, is no, it's that, it's that pastors are very weak and are not willing to share what the truth of the Scripture is. And as a result of that, you end up with people who are confused. God says, there's none that are seeking after me. There's none who are doing good, and they like to devour those who are righteous. That's what the Scripture says, and that's absolutely true. Could you imagine me saying what I just said on national TV or, or in front of, uh, you know, a gay and lesbian alliance or something? Do you think they'd stand up and applaud and say, you know, Pastor, you're so right, I will change right now? Well, of course not. They'd be getting very belligerent and very angry about it because it's going against what they have chosen to believe. There's a report that is very famous. It's called the Kinsey Report, and supposedly there were some 10% of all human beings who were born as homosexuals, but nobody's ever notified. As, there are very few people who have ever recognized or even made the statement, though it is very clearly in print, that Kinsey himself was a practicing homosexual, and the people that he chose to interview were people in prison and in labor camps and a variety of other isolationist places, and if they had even admission to one homosexual contact, he classified them as homosexual. But the University of Chicago several years ago did a study demonstrating that less than 3% of those who were polled could even admit that they have had exclusive homosexual desires through the majority of their life as well as, as long as they can remember. And they said the closer number is 1%. But there's a 10% mythology that has been entrenched into American society, so much so that people don't even argue with those figures. And so what we end up with is making choices. We make choices to act in certain ways, and God says the choices that are being made, he said, well, they're not seeking me. 
He says, as a result of that, their life is an abomination to me because they reject me as the only true God and they reject my word as, as, as my commands to the life that would be a blessing to them. And they eat my people up like they eat bread and they don't call on the Lord. Verse 5, there, there they are in great fear for God is with the generation of the righteous. You shame the counsel of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people. Let Jacob rejoice in Israel, he says, be glad. So the wicked will be in terror, he's saying, when God acts to protect his children from them. That's what he's saying when it says in verse 5, they are in great fear, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You shame the counsel of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. That's why Jesus in Matthew 18, verse 6 said, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So the Lord has a way of protecting those who belong to him. In verse 7, when he says, Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion, David is longing for the Lord to rule and to reign on earth. That's his desire. He wants to see Messiah rule. His great desire is that the Lord will deliver Israel from the presence of that which is wicked. And in the Psalms, again in Psalm 2, verse 9, uh, we read, You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And when this happens, when the Lord comes and rules and reigns and deals with those who have harmed his children, those who love the Lord will rejoice because his honor is vindicated. That's what he means when he says, oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion, meaning may Messiah rule and reign when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. And now, Psalm 18. Psalm 18 is a short psalm of about 50 verses. <laughs> Let's see what time it is. Yeah. Let's see. For this psalm, I had one page. For Psalm 18, I have three pages. I am going to do more reading and just condensing, though, obviously. And you'll see this, this as we begin. But uh, Psalm 18, beginning at verse 1. Reading to verse 3, and we'll get into our study of Psalm 18. This is a psalm of David. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. And so David is giving a psalm of thanks to God. And the psalm really refers to God saving him from his enemies. I want you to notice how he says, God is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my strength, my shield. God is the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold. These are all military metaphors revealing God's protection of David in times of attack or war. He, say, he says, I love the Lord. I love the Lord because God has been faithful to deliver me throughout all of my struggles. God is my rock because he gives me stability. God is my fortress because he provides security. God is my deliverer because he provides relief. God is my strength who gives me endurance. God is my shield because he keeps the enemy's weapons from penetrating my life. God is the horn of my salvation because he provides victory over the enemy. And God is a stronghold that the enemy cannot enter. So when David is under attack, I want you to notice this. He calls upon the Lord knowing that God will deliver him. And the reason he does call on the Lord, and this is so important for us guys, when you read your Psalms and all, you ask yourself, why would David be rejoicing over this? Well, the reason that he's rejoicing in the Lord because is simple. It's because he put his trust in the Lord, and God is trustworthy. That's why. He's trusting not in the arm of man. Now, this is what makes us Christians. We believe that God provides security for us. We believe that God provides deliverance for us. That's what Christians believe. 
We believe that he's our refuge. We believe that he's our shield. We believe that he's trustworthy. And we believe that he has delivered and will continue to do so. And that's why he can praise the Lord. That's why in verse 3 he says, I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. I can trust him. In 2 Timothy, in chapter 4, verse 18, the apostle Paul said, The Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so that's why he's praising the Lord, and he's calling him by these names and using these metaphors because he has God on his side. Verse 4, The pangs of death encompassed me, and the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him even to his ears. Now, I love the fact that he admits in verse 6 that he was distressed. Sometimes you might feel, gosh, I don't have any faith because I'm feeling anxious right now. I, I must not have. Well, David said, listen, in my distress, I called out on the Lord. In the time of fear and great discomfort, I called on him. I was in a critical situation, and I needed help, and I knew that man couldn't deliver me. I was in a position that I was under tremendous attack, and there's no solution to this outside of God. I was stressed about it, and I cried out to him, and he saved me. And that's what we do, too. In the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 1, you might want to turn there. I want, to refer this, uh, I want you to read this with me, would you please? 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul gives us the same insight in that particular portion of Scripture. When I'm afraid, when I'm in distress, when I have tremendous concern, when there's fear in my heart, I'm wondering if I have any, any way that I can get out then I have to call upon the Lord, even as David. All of us do. Now, Paul knew something of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, verses 8 through 10. Listen to what he said to the church there in Corinth. He said, we do not want you to be ignorant. That word ignorant means without knowledge. We don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we have the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us, past, present, and future. He's delivered us in the past. He's delivering us now and he will do so into the future. Listen carefully as you turn on back to the Psalms. This is what makes our faith different than the religious philosophies of the world. I don't have faith in faith. I have faith in a God who delivers me. I don't have a theoretical relationship with a religious system where if I do certain things, I might obligate a powerful God to do something on my behalf to reciprocate because I did something for him, therefore he did, does something for me. Listen, in every system of religion, when you begin to deal with one of the topics of Scripture that, that we know under the word propitiation, and some of you know that word, others may not, the word propitiation is a word that refers to satisfying the anger of a, of a, of a just and righteous God. And, and the question is, if God is just and, and God is righteous, which the Scripture says that He is, and He's angry over sin, then how do you placate Him? How do you satisfy Him? How do you, how do, you do anything that would cause God to not be angry anymore? And the Bible says that God is angry uh, and his, He pours His wrath out on people continually, those who have rejected Him. The, the wrath of God abides on them, John 3.36 says. And so here's something for you to think about for just a moment. In every pagan religious system, in every pagan religious system that believes in a God that has any kind of righteous or righteousness or goodness, in every pagan religious system, there is an attempt 
to satisfy his anger and meet his requirements. And in every one of those systems, it requires tremendous sacrifice on the part of the person who's trying to satisfy their anger. And so in some of the pagan religious systems, there are even mythologies and, and, and fables that relate to kings, for example, who in order to uh, set sail, and because the god of the wind is angry, uh, he needs to have favor with the god of the wi wind and all, so he sacrifices his daughter, and that makes the angry wind god satisfied. Then off go the, the ships sailing to war, and they have victory because this angry god was placated. And you can multiply that through Greek, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, and a variety of other mythologies. Propitiation is always the human being doing something that is very difficult to get favor from the god that they want a blessing from. And so it has even crept into what is called Christian faith. So that on Easter, yearly, in the Philippines, you will have somebody who had asked God to do something for them, perhaps to heal a child or give them a job or something great, and they will crucify themselves every year. And we see it in the newspaper around Easter. Some Filipino man will be seen on the news carrying the cross. He gets to a certain site. They nail him to the cross, and he goes up for a while, and then he comes down. And they ask, why are you doing that? And he says, because... I asked God to heal my mom. He did, and I told him I would do this for him. That is the heart of paganism. Christianity is different because God doesn't require man to do that. God did it himself. He satisfied his own anger, and God poured his wrath out on his son Jesus Christ on our behalf. He became the sin offering for us, and that's how that works. And so David rejoices because God is the one who protects him. God is the one who shows him favor because God is worthy to be praised and God cares for him. And that's why he's blessing the Lord and that's why he's saying that God is wonderful. And, and when he speaks about the pangs of death encompassing me, the floods of ungodliness making me afraid, the, the sorrows of Sheol surrounding me, the snares of death confronting me, he says, but in my distress, I call upon the Lord. I cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple. My cry came before him, even to his ears. Even though I am weak, in him I am made strong. And there are times that I do go through struggles and hard times. But my God will deliver me. My God delivered me in the past. My God delivers me in the present. And I'm certain my God will continue to deliver me into the future. So I can call upon him in my time of sorrow, in my time of struggle, because one, he knows my frame that I'm simply dust, and he has pity on me as a father pities a child. And so I cry out to him in my weakness, and God makes me strong. And I can trust him because he's a loving father. Turning back to Psalm 18, moving on, he says in verse 7, the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils, devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were uncovered. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. And so nature is seen as a powerful tool in God's hand. That's the whole point he's making. He's saying God is the God over all nature. He's not nature. He's above nature, and he uses it as he desires. In Deuteronomy 33, verse 26, the Bible says, There is no one like the God of Jeshurun, or the God of Israel, who rides the heavens to help you, and in his excellency on the clouds. And so he's saying nature is a tool in God's hands. Verse 16, he's, he sent from above, he took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me. 
for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. I was closed in. I was overwhelmed. I was over my head, and I was drowning with enemies everywhere. But God is my support. That word support there, by the way, God is my staff. He's the one that I can rest on who holds me up. So when people say that your God is your crutch, you can say amen. He's my support. You know, and we've heard that before. Somebody says, well, you know what? That's the problem with you Christians. You know, God is your crutch. No, he's not. He's not my crutch alone. You know, he's like a litter. He's like the, you know, I, 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 don't, I need more than just one staff. He carries me around because he knows I can't walk without his help. I don't have a problem admitting that. Some people do. I don't. I need his support. I need it every day. Without him, I couldn't make it, and there's, there's no doubt about that. And notice he says he's become my support, and he's also delivered me into an expansive place. Uh, when I was at one time feeling crowded and, and crushed, he has he's removed me from that, and he's placed me in a place that is very without restriction, without feeling like I'm being hemmed in. You know, uh, I shouldn't tell you this, but I will. My wife, Marie, has one, if I want to irritate her, and I do sometimes, uh, some of you husbands know what I mean. I mean, just sometimes it's just fun to get her mad. I um, don't know why I do that. Um, I don't know. She deserves it. But I, um, <laughs> of course she doesn't. But there's one thing about Marie that I found out when we were dating that I have never forgotten, and she does not like me to get too, she doesn't like anybody to get too close to her. She doesn't like that. She gets claustrophobic very easily. And so there are times when I will do it on purpose. You know, she'll be in a corner, you know, doing something, and I'll, I'll kind of just kind of back towards her, and I'll start pressing her into the wall. Oh, she freaks out, and I laugh. It's just a lot of fun. Um, she doesn't like that. And, you know, and if I want to bother her, I put my hand on her face. And she, she does not like that. And you want to know something? My grandson, Josiah, doesn't like that either. It's really cute, you know, so I do it to him quite often. <laughs> and he hits, he'll hit you. He's only seven months old, and he hits your hand, you know, get it out of my face, you know, get out of my face. And me, I don't like it either, but she doesn't know that. So you can tell her, I don't care. Because there's something about being crowded into something that makes most people uncomfortable. And so David is saying that my enemies have crowded me in. I was over my head, drowning in them. But Lord, you know what you did? You lifted me up and put me into an expansive place. You gave me breathing room. And you moved them all away from me so I can catch my breath once again. And that's how the Lord works in our life. And that's what he does. He brought me, he says in verse 19, out into a broad place, delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also blameless before him and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Now, this is an important thing to look at. Uh, it's not, he is not saying, as it could easily be misinterpreted, he's not saying that I have made myself righteous and based on my works he has done this. No, his righteousness is derived from his faith in God. That's the point he's making when he says the things that I've been doing demonstrate that I have faith in God. And so by faith in him, I've been walking in integrity. By faith in him, I have kept his ways. By faith in him, I have followed his word. And the result has been that God has blessed me as I have obeyed him. God has delivered me because God is faithful to his promises that he would do so. You see, listen, if you want to be blessed by the Lord, of course, it's a wonderful thing to simply be obedient and to do the things that he says. And as you do so, the Lord meets you in those places of obedience, and that's the point he's making. In verse 25, with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. With the devious, you'll show yourself shrewd. For you will save the humble people, but will bring down haughty looks. 
And so God sees the heart, and God rewards or God judges based on the condition of the heart. The merciful and the blameless, those he speaks of being pure, are receiving a reward based on their inner motives. It reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 7 and 8, when he said, Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. But notice how he says, But those who are devious will be treated according to their own hearts. The wicked, in other words, are going to reap what they have sown in life. James 2.13 says, Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so he's going to deal with you according to your way of being. In verse 28, For you will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop. And by my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer. He sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. Now, I'm not stumbling around in the dark because God is providing a light for me. I don't know how many of you will relate to this very well. Perhaps some of you will. When I was in the military, I had one major concern, and that is anything that had to do with doing anything at night. Not because I'm afraid of the dark, but because I can't see in the dark. And so if I had to do something at night because I'm night blind, it's just an ugly thing. I didn't know I was night blind until I was older. But I can now remember as a little boy, I was playing basketball with a friend of mine, and it was dusk, and I couldn't see the basket that we were shooting at, and he was just ripping me and all, and I was thinking, how come I can't even, and I didn't realize it's because I was night blind. I can remember as a little guy, I was playing at my grandmother's house. My brother Frank and I were little boys, and we were running, and I ran right into a faucet. Actually, it was a, a pipe with the spigot on it. I ran right into it and snapped it at the base, and I did not see it, and I, didn't, I never understood why I couldn't see that. My brother ran around it, but I couldn't see it. And as I started growing older, I began to realize I just can't see in the dark. And so what I used to think was natural, I thought that every person who woke up in the middle of the night would have to stand and put one foot in front of the other and kind of feel around until you got to a light switch. I thought everybody did that. It turns out that that's not true. Some of you have great vision in the dark and all. I don't. And so as I was reading this, and I'm thinking in terms of the military, and I want you to see this in that way. When he says, you will light my lamp, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness, uh, for by you I can run against a troop. By my God I can leap over a wall. Listen, if you're running in the dark and there's a wall there and you're night blind, you're going to run head on into it. You, you need night vision goggles. You need some form of light to see when you're in that situation. You go into a darkened room and you're looking for a terrorist or something, you better hope that you have vision there. You better hope you can see them before they see you. He's saying, God, in my combat, gives me light to see where the enemy is. Now, where does that light come from? It comes to the Holy Spirit, and it comes by the Word of God. And you'll see this in a minute. I'll develop this in a second. But he's speaking about warfare, but it's also spiritual in nature. He says to us, uh, I can run against a troop. I can leap over a wall. God's way is perfect. The Word of the Lord is proven. He's a shield to all who trust in Him. Who is God except the Lord? Who is a rock except our God? It's God who arms me with strength. He makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer. He sets me on high places, teaches my hands to make war. He's speaking of spiritual warfare. God gives me strength. I can be strong and I can be victorious against my enemies at one time. God is my strength because he's a rock. He gives me spiritual weapons. He gives me stability. He gives me power. He gives me the ability to fight a battle thoroughly. He provides weapons of warfare for me. That's what we saw in Ephesians. Remember in chapter 6 in the book of Ephesians, verse 10, how that Paul said, My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Remember the weapons of the warfare that He gives to us? We have the shield and the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation. Our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have the sword of the Spirit. We have prayer. 
You remember those various articles that he gives to us? That's the point he's making. God is my light. He reveals the enemy, gives me strength, protects me. He's my shield. He does all of this because I'm in a war. And so one of the things, obviously, that every one of us needs to remember is the reality of that war. The reality of the war. And David is saying that he gives me the strength because God loves me. He delights in me. When he says in verse 35, you have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarged my path under, under me so that my feet did not slip. Every person who has ever had any kind of combat knows that your feet had better be planted solidly or you're going to lose. And he's saying, God is my sure foundation. He strengthens me so that I do not fall. Verse 37, I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. I have wounded them so that they were not able to rise. They've fallen under my feet. For you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies. That speaks of victory. So that I destroyed those who hated me. They cried out. But there was none to save them, even to the Lord. He didn't answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust before the wind. I cast them out like dirt in the streets. You have delivered me from the strivings of the people. You've made me the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they obey me. The foreigners submit to me. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God who avenges me and subdues the peoples under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up above those who rise against me. You, you have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles. Sing praises to your name. Great deliverance he gives to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David, and his descendants forevermore. Now, I want to make a, a couple of points, and we're going to close. I want you to see verse 37 here first. I have pursued my enemies and overtake them, overtaken them. Neither did I turn back again until they were destroyed. Let me give you a spirit, spiritual application to this. A spiritual application to this. You have obviously the practical. David as a warrior captures his enemies and destroys them. That's the picture. Spiritual application, spiritual warfare. You don't take sins prisoner and keep them as pets. You kill them. Keep that in mind. And you say, what do you mean by that, David? Well, some people seem to think that some sins are real bad and therefore should have nothing to do with them. But other sins aren't really that bad, and I can do them once in a while. And sometimes we may even feed those sins simply by paying attention to them. I heard about a lady who found a baby raccoon. And the raccoon is real cute. And she began to raise it as a pet. And because it was so small and all, she was bottle feeding it. And as she was bottle feeding the raccoon and all, it, it became very attached to her and became like her kid in a way. I mean, she loved it like some people like kittens and some people like puppies. She happened to have a raccoon. One of her friends was, was aware of wildlife and said, that raccoon's getting to the age that it's going to become dangerous. You're going to need to turn loose of it because if you don't, while its wild nature is going to come out, and it can harm you. It, it may look cute and all, and it is, but it's a wild animal. And just because you've been nursing it with a bottle and because you've wrapped it up like a doll and carried it around like a baby doesn't mean that it's what you think it is. Well, this lady said, there's just no way. I've cared for it like a child. He loves me like a mom. It's bonded with me. Make a long story very short. When it got to a certain age, she put her face next to the raccoon to do what she'd normally done, you know, give it a little kiss, and it took his claws and ripped both sides of her face with it because that's what they do. You can't have a wild thing like that and domesticate it. You can't make it your pet. They just won't become your pet. They're wild inside, and even if we want to convince ourselves that they can be our friend, in its nature, it can't do that. Well, sin 
you can't make sins your friends. What you have to do is you have to say, uh, and this is an easy thing to do if we would do it, we have to say something like this. We have to say, uh, this sin is something that put Jesus on the cross. How can it be my friend when it's what he died for to set me free from? If we understand sin for what it is, we pursue it, not to enjoy it, but to kill it, to put your foot on its neck and say, I have victory over this. I at one time drank to excess and was pretty much what I would call an alcoholic. That sin is dead. I put my foot on it in Christ, and it's over. The same is true with every major sin that I ever had. Because when I got saved, I said, you know what, Lord, I'm not going to be pursuing women anymore. I'm not going to be flying off the handle and become angry anymore. I'm not going to be doing the drugs anymore. Those have to die. I'm not going to keep them as friends. They are my enemies. And because they're my enemies, I want nothing to do with them. That's how it works in your spiritual life, guys. That's why you have weapons of warfare. The sword isn't so that you can just look at yourself in it when you have it all polished up and say, oh, don't I look nice. A sword is used to thrust in order to destroy because the enemy wants to destroy you, you see? And that's what David is glorifying in. He says, God has taught my hands for war. He's taught me how to stand firm in him in a time of battle. He's given me the shield and every element of defense, and he's on my side and gives me victory. Because of that, I've been able to pursue my enemies I've overcome them. I have destroyed them. I put my feet on their neck, showing I have vanquished them, and they're not going to be alive in my presence anymore. That's how it works. So what do you do? Are you saying, well, one time for all time? I'm saying every day you wake up with the same mentality, and you say, God, today I'm going to have some more battles. And today I want to be victorious, so the armor's got to go on, and I've got to be prepared. And as a result of that, Lord, I, I anticipate in you having victory in Romans 8, 13, the Bible says, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Colossians 3, 5 says, Put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And so, Lord, you have done this work. Now, finally, in verses 43 and 45, you have a dual application. I want you to notice that he says, you have delivered me from the strivings of the people. You have made me the head of the nations. David is on one hand speaking as the king of Israel, a conquering king. But secondly, it's a messianic psalm speaking about when the Messiah rules and reigns. The foreigners submit to me. Foreigners fade away. They're frightened. They come out of their hideouts. This is a picture of Messiah's rule and reign also. And then finally, he closes with praise to God. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It's God who avenges me. And I, I underscore that in my own heart. That saves me a whole lot of grudges that I could be carrying for people who've harmed me over the years. It is God who avenges me and subdues the peoples under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me above, up above all those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles. Sing praises to your name. Great deliverance he gives to his king. Shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. Not only did God give victory to David, but also to David's descendants. Because our children can also learn the ways of God, be protected by him. That's why Psalm 103, 17 says, The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. And so now what I'm trying to do in the Lord is I'm trying to remember that God gives mercy and blessings not only to those of us who are saved, but we as parents take them and, and say to our children, honor the Lord and fear the Lord and God will bless you. And then as we grow older and become grandparents, and we have the joyous privilege of bringing the same kind of knowledge to our grandchildren, the same thing, saying to them, you know, fear the Lord, depart from evil, and God will bless you. And for me, I'm excited about that because I'm seeing the hand of the Lord in my life, my wife. We pray the hand of the Lord is on our children's life. And what a joy it is to know that God didn't stop blessing us, but he blessed our children and our grandchildren until he should return. And for me, that's an exciting thing. And therefore, as a believer, 
we will trust in the Lord who gives us victory. And we will trust in the Lord who avenges us. And we will serve him with joy.